Hey everyone, I'm going to be reading to you again today from Hudson Taylor, Deep in the Heart of China by Janet and Jeff Bangi. We are on chapter six titled A Dead Man, A Dead Man in London. Taylor, how would you like to be my apprentice? Dr. Hardy asked after Hudson had been his assistant in Hull for about a year. Hudson's mouth dropped open. He stopped mixing the medicine he was preparing and turned to the doctor with a questioning look. You heard me right, said the doctor. I want you to become my apprentice. It will be five years of hard study for you, but I know you can do it. You have what it takes to be a good doctor. Thank you, sir, replied Hudson, stunned by the offer. It's a great honor to be asked. I'll have to pray about it before I give you an answer. Dr. Hardy nodded. He had expected no less. He knew Hudson prayed about everything. It was such a tempting offer. Hudson liked the idea of a, being a real doctor rather than a doctor's assistant, but the more he thought and prayed about it, the more convinced he became that he should reject the offer. While he could see the advantage of being a qualified doctor, he also recognized that inside of him was a burning desire to be in China as soon as he could. Yes, he needed more medical training before he left, but he thought he could get that training faster by going to London. So he decided to turn down Dr. Hardy's offer and resign as his assistant. He also talked to his parents about his decision. He knew that the offer was a wonderful opportunity, so it was arranged that Mr. Taylor would release Hudson's cousin, John, from work in the pharmacy so he could come to Hull and be Dr. Hardy's new assistant. A week after announcing his resignation as Dr. Hardy's assistant, things began to fall into place for Hudson. Uncle Benjamin, whom Hudson and Amelia had stayed with on their first trip to London, offered to have Hudson stay with him for a week or two. And the Chinese Evangelization Society agreed to pay Hudson's medical tuition at London Hospital. Hoping to get a doctor into inland China as soon as possible, the society was more generous to Hudson than he could have imagined. It offered to provide his rent money as well. At the same time, Hudson's father also volunteered to support him while he was in London. Instead of having no financial aid, Hudson now had offers from two sources. But which proposal should he accept? He didn't want to get too indebted to the Chinese Evangelization Society in case things didn't work out in China. He also wasn't sure he wanted to get too tied to one organization in case God called him to do things on his own. Accepting his father's aid though, would also be difficult. His father was not doing well financially, and Hudson knew the offer represented a big sacrifice for the family. As he considered whose support to accept, he wrote to both his father and the Chinese Evangelization Society, letting each one know about the other's willingness to support him and promising to make a decision soon. As he prayed about the decision before him, a strange thought crept into his mind. What if he turned them both down? What an ideal way to stretch his faith a little more. Could he rely on God and not on his father or the Chinese Evangelization Society to meet his needs? He would be in a new city where nobody knew him. What a perfect opportunity to trust God to supply his needs. Immediately, Hudson felt that this was what God wanted him to do. He picked up his pen and wrote another pair of letters, the first to his father and the other to the Chinese Evangelization Society, thanking them for their offer to support and telling them he would not be accepting it. As he wrote, he decided that they would both think he had accepted the other's offer. It was perfect. He would be free to rely on God alone to meet his needs without other people, especially his mother, worrying about how he was doing. Two weeks later, in early September 1852, he stood at the bow of a coastal steamship headed for London. As the ship carefully made its way through the thick fog that blanketed the banks of the River Thames, he pulled his overcoat tight around him to keep out the cold, damp air. What lay ahead for him, he did not know. One thing is for sure, he promised himself, the next time I stand on, the, on board a ship, it will be headed for China. The boarding house where Uncle Benjamin lived was small but comfortable, and Hudson spent two enjoyable weeks with him. In another boarding house just around the corner, his cousin Tom lived in a tiny third floor attic room. Tom invited Hudson to move in and share the room with him. Hudson lugged his belongings up the three flights of stairs to Tom's room. He enrolled in a surgery course at London Hospital in Whitechapel, and once again, his life quickly fell into a routine of work, study, prayer, and fellowship, not to mention the time 
He spent each day practicing writing Chinese pictographs. Hudson had managed to save a little money during his time in Hole, and he was determined to make it go as far as possible. To do this, he experimented until he came up with a diet that cost very little and did not leave him feeling too hungry. On the walk home from London Hospital, he would stop at a bakery and buy a two penny loaf of brown bread. He would have the baker cut the loaf in half. One half of the loaf was his dinner and the other half would be his breakfast. Of course, he could have cut the loaf in half himself, but he asked the baker to do it because he thought his hunger might tempt him to cut too large a half for dinner, leaving too small a piece to satisfy, satisfy his hunger at breakfast. On the way to the hospital in the morning, he would stop at a fruit stand and buy two apples for his lunch. When he was thirsty, he drank water. By eating only apples and bread and drinking water, Hudson was able to live on three pennies a day plus what he paid his cousin for half the rent on the attic room. To save himself even more money, Hudson walked everywhere he needed to go. He walked four miles to the hospital in Whitechapel and back each day. He walked to church on Sunday. He also walked a four mile round trip to the, shopping, the shipping office once a month. He went to the shipping office as a favor for Mrs. Finch, his former landlady in Hull. Mrs. Finch's husband was a ship's officer for a shipping line that operated out of London. Half of his wages were kept at the office for Mrs. Finch to collect. Normally, Mrs. Finch had the money sent up to her in Hull, but there was a charge for this service, so she had asked Hudson if he would go to the shipping office for her once a month to collect her husband's wages and send them to her. This way, she would save having to pay the service charge. Mrs. Finch had been good to Hudson and Hull, and he knew she needed all the money she could get, so he was happy to do the favor for her. Hudson had been in London about three months when he got a letter from Mrs. Finch saying she needed the money from her husband's wages right away because she was about to fall behind in her rent. Hudson was very busy with his studies right then and did not think he could spare time to walk to the shipping office to collect the money. Without giving it much thought, he decided to send Mrs. Finch the last of his own money. He would go later in the week and collect her husband's wages and repay himself from that. This way they would get, they would both be happy. Mrs. Finch would quickly get the money she desperately needed and Hudson would not have to give up half a day of study to get it for her. There was just one problem with the solution, however. When Hudson finally went to the shipping office to get Mr. Finch's wages, he got some bad news. Mr. Finch, it seemed, had abandoned his ship and headed for a gold rush. Since Mr. Finch was no longer on board ship, there were no wages to collect. Hudson was stunned. He explained to the clerk in the shipping office how he had just sent Mrs. Finch the last of his money and now had no way of being repaid. The clerk was sympathetic. He even apologized for Mr. Finch's behavior, but he pointed out to Hudson that men deserted their ships and their families every day and there was nothing that could be done about it. It took a few moments for the seriousness of the situation to settle in on Hudson. He had only a few pennies left. And not only was he not going to be repaid for the money he'd already sent to Mrs. Finch, she was not going to get any more money from her husband to pay her rent and take care of the children. Hudson left the office and began the walk home. It would have been normal to be depressed by such news, but as he walked on, he found himself getting happier and happier. When he had arrived in London, his intention was to trust God to provide all his needs, but he'd always had the money he'd saved in whole to get by on. Hudson's money would have eventually run out, leaving him no other option but to rely on God. Mr. Finch and his gold-digging ambitions had only brought that day about sooner. By the time Hudson climbed the stairs to his attic room, he was excited about what happened next. How would God meet his needs? That night, Hudson continued with his studies. He had to stop for a few minutes to make himself a new notebook. It was cheaper for him to make his own notebook than to buy a ready-made one from the store. To make the notebook, he took a stack of blank paper and then sewed it together. Just as he was finishing the last stitch, the needle jerked through the paper and pricked him on the finger. There was no blood and a minute later, Hudson had forgotten all about the prick. That was until the next day. It was noon and Hudson was sitting in a lecture when he began to feel sick. The room started to swirl around him and he could no longer concentrate on what the lecturer was saying. Hudson stumbled outside into the fresh air and had a drink of water. He felt revived, so he made his way back to the lecture hall. 
He thought he must have overexerted himself the day before walking to the shipping yard and staying up late to study. Back in the lecture hall, he began to feel weaker and weaker until he was too weak to even hold the pencil he was taking notes with. Obviously, he hadn't exhausted his fingers walking to the shipping office or sitting up late to study. Something else was wrong. After the lecture, he dragged himself back into, sur into the surgery where earlier that day, he and some of the other students who had been dissecting the body of a man who had died of malignant fever, they'd been dissecting the body of a man who had died of malignant fever. He knew he should help the other students clean up, but all he could do was slump into the nearest chair. I don't know what's come over me, he said to the surgeon in charge of the dissection. Then he described his symptoms. The surgeon went pale. He cleared his throat several times before finally speaking. What has happened to you is clear enough. You must have cut yourself while dissecting the body and infected yourself with a malignant fever. Hudson shook his head. That's not possible. I would know if I cut myself with a scalpel. I'm sure I didn't. Here, look at my hands. As Hudson raised his hands for the surgeon to inspect, a thought crossed his mind. It couldn't be the pinprick I gave myself while sewing a book together last night, could it? The surgeon thought for a moment. It doesn't take a large opening to let in an infection. He reached forward and put his hand on Hudson's shoulder. Then lowering his voice and looking straight into Hudson's blue eyes, he said, you must get a coach home as quickly as you can and get your affairs in order for you are a dead man. Hudson couldn't believe what he just heard. It wasn't that he doubted the surgeon's diagnosis or that he thought people survived malignant fever. They nor normally didn't. What Hudson couldn't believe was that he wouldn't make it to China after all. I'm not afraid to die, he said, looking straight at the surgeon. In fact, I look forward to meeting my maker, but unless I am very much mistaken, I cannot die because God has called me to China and I have not yet been there. I may get very sick, but I doubt that I will die. The surgeon was surprised. This is a fine time for you to argue with me as to why you shouldn't die, he said. Accept the inevitable. Get home as quickly as you can or you will not make it home at all. Hudson did go home. At first he tried to walk, but he was too weak. So he used his last penny to catch a horse-drawn omnibus. As it rattled along the uneven cobblestone streets, Hudson had to concentrate hard to stay awake. If he fell asleep, he might go right past his stop. Eventually, the omnibus came to a stop near the boarding house where Hudson practically fell out of the vehicle. The maid met him at the door and he asked her to get him some hot water. He began climbing up the three flights of stairs that led to his room. He was crawling by the time he got to the top. He had just enough strength left to reach up and turn the doorknob. He crawled into the room and the maid soon followed with a bowl of hot water which she sat, sat down on the floor beside him. Hudson put his hand in the basin of water. After soaking it a minute or two, he took his scalpel from his jacket pocket, clamped his teeth together, and before he could change his mind, sliced the scalpel into his finger he pricked the night before. Searing hot pain shot up his arm. He dropped the scalpel and began squeezing the wound he'd made on his finger as hard as he could, hoping to squeeze out all of the malignant fever. Blood spurted out, and as it did so, Hudson's grip loosened and he slumped backwards and faded from consciousness. The next thing Hudson knew, he was being dragged into his bed and shaken awake by Uncle Benjamin. As Hudson regained consciousness, Uncle Benjamin told him he'd sent for his own doctor, and soon one of the best doctors in London was standing beside the bed. He examined Hudson from head to toe and confirmed the malignant fever diagnosis. The doctor had one word of hope to offer Hudson. If you have been living moderately and not drinking beer late into the night, you might pull through. If you have been drinking and partying, I don't see any hope for you, he said. Hudson would have laughed if his ribs didn't ache so badly. If it's a matter of sober living, then I have more chance of making it than just about anyone I know, he whispered to the doctor with a smile. It's going to be a hard battle. You will be in and out of consciousness a lot, and if you do recover, it will be months before you are back to your old self. You need to keep your strength up, drink port wine, and eat as many beef chops as you can, the doctor advised him. Hudson tried to concentrate, but the doctor's words faded away as he lost consciousness. He spent several days drifting in and out of consciousness. Uncle Benjamin and Tom took turns looking after him and feeding him the wine and chops the doctor had ordered.
Each day, the doctor came by to give him quinine to help fight the fever. Hudson was in this zone between life and death for many days. Finally, he seemed to turn a corner and begin to get better. Before long, he was sitting up in bed, receiving visitors. On one visit, a fellow student told him how two students from a neighboring hospital had both accidentally cut themselves during the dissection of a dead body. Both of them had died. Hudson shuddered. God had truly spared his life so he could go to China. It was only a few days later that Hudson felt well enough to walk downstairs. Tom helped him and slowly they made their way to the parlor. Hudson slumped onto the sofa, exhausted from the effort, but how good it felt to be out of his bedroom. When the doctor arrived to check on him, he was amazed to find Hudson downstairs in the parlor. The doctor worried about how he would make it up the stairs again. After checking his patient over and asking a few questions, he suggested that Hudson go to the country as soon as his health would allow it. The fresh air and wholesome food would do him good. Hudson thought about the doctor's advice for a while. It would be good to go home. For once, the thought of his mother fussing over him seemed wonderful, but there was the matter of money. He didn't have enough for the train trip back to Barnsley, and if he did get any money, it would surely have to go towards paying the doctor for all of his care. Alone in the parlor, Hudson began to pray about the situation. As he prayed, he kept feeling that he should go back to the shipping office. Part of him thought this was a crazy idea, like clutching at straws, but another part of him felt that God was directing him to go there. After about an hour, he came to the firm conclusion that God was indeed leading him to go. But when should he go? That was the question. He had been in bed in a weakened state for days. It had taken all of his energy to get down the stairs to the parlor. And like the doctor, he too was having doubts about his ability to climb back up them. It would obviously be some time before he could make it to the shipping office. Or would it? There was that little voice in his head again reminding him that God says... All things are possible to those who believe. Hudson believed, so he told God he was willing to make the two-mile walk to the office if God would give him the strength to do it. When he had finished telling this to God, as sick as he still was, a tremendous peace came over him. He asked the maid to fetch his hat and walking stick from upstairs. With a surprised look on her face, she headed off upstairs. When she came back, Hudson was standing at the front door, ready to walk to the shipping office. Hudson set himself a slow pace. He walked past two shop fronts and stopped for breath at the third. When he came to a hill, he allowed himself to stop at every shop front. In this way, he slowly wound his way through the streets of London. As he walked and stumbled along, he wondered what God's purpose for this trip would turn out to be. Finally, he sat down heavily on the front steps of the building that housed the shipping office. Businessmen stepped around him as he sat and panted and waited for the strength to climb the stairs to the second floor office. Excuse me. Eventually, Hudson lumbered up the stairs and entered the shipping office. A look of relief spread across the face of the clerk as he entered. I'm so glad to see you again, sir, he said as Hudson flopped into the nearest chair. I didn't know how to contact you. I have some good news. There were two Mr. Finches on the same boat, and it was the other one, not your Mr. Finch, that ran off to the gold fields. It was all a mix-up, and I am very sorry. Here's the money we owe you. He handed Hudson an envelope filled with money. The clerk went on to ask Hudson about his health, then insisted that he stay and share lunch before heading back home on an omnibus, of course. The next day, Hudson went to pay the doctor, but since Hudson was in the same profession, the doctor refused payment. Hudson, though, insisted on at least paying for the quinine. The doctor accepted the money, then told Hudson he wasn't yet strong enough to be out walking around. Hudson told him the story of going to the shipping office the other day, or the day before. Impossible, interrupted the doctor. Why, I left you lying in the parlor, more like a ghost than a man. Hudson had to assure the doctor over and over that with God's help, he really had walked all that way. By the time he left the surgery, the doctor was nearly in tears. I would give all the world to have faith like yours, he said, shaking Hudson's hand. You can. It's free for the asking, Hudson replied as he turned to leave. There was just enough money left for paying the doctor for Hudson, to, after paying the doctor, for Hudson to buy a train ticket to Barnsley and some good food to eat on the way and to hire a wagon to take him right to his parents' home when he got there.
God, it seemed, had everything under control after all.